Okay, thank you. All right, like, sounds very good. So this is a paper about overlapping ownership and product innovation, and it's written jointly together with Aruna Stenbaka, who is also here um, in the in the Zoom meeting. And both of us are at Hanken School of Economics. I understand that, that you're interested in overlapping ownership. Let me briefly explain uh, what it's about. So overlapping ownership is essentially an umbrella term, which can refer to two types of ownership structures. Uh, one type is so-called common ownership, and common ownership happens when there's a common owner, for example, a financial institution or, or uh, an investor such as BlackRock, which holds stakes in several firms that are also competitor again, competitors against each other. Okay, so several firms that compete against each other in the product market. For example, BlackRock might own shares in airline companies, several airline companies, and these airline companies also compete against each other in the product market. Okay, so that's the first type of ownership structure uh, that we're interested in. And then the second type is so-called cross ownership, whereby competing firms directly hold stakes, uh, financial stakes in one another. So for example, competitor A might hold a financial stake in competitor B, and conversely, competitor B also holds a financial stake in competitor A. Okay. Both of these ownership structures have the feature that firms uh, may not care exclusively about their own profit, uh, but they also partially internalize the effect of their own decisions on the rival's profit. For example, because they have a common owner, or for example, uh, through um, uh, financial stakes uh, directly in the rival cross ownership. And so the it, firms may partially internalize each other's profits. And that's the feature of, of, com of overlapping ownership, which is crucial. And it's, it's present uh, both with common ownership and with cross ownership. Okay. Competition authorities are concerned by overlapping ownership uh, because um, it might relax competition in the product market. The theoretical foundation is relatively clear. Um, firms, um, if they have a common owner or, or if they have a financial stake in the rival firm directly, then they might understand that, okay, they, they make a decision about price themselves, uh, but that decision also affects the profit of the rival firm. Okay. And for example, firms might take this, might internalize uh, such an effect uh, through overlapping ownership, and it might induce uh, them to, uh, uh, to to compete not not so fiercely anymore. Okay, so overlapping ownership can can soften competition in the product market. This is established theoretically, and there also is also some empirical support. Uh, for this view. And it's important also to place this discussion in light of the rising markups, which we, which we see, for example, in the US. In the US, during the past decades, markups have been going up. This is an important trend. And then the question is, to what extent has overlapping ownership, for example, common ownership, contributed to this trend of rising markups? So that's, that's the concern. Okay. What we do in this paper is uh, we're kind of taking as given that, okay, overlapping ownership can perhaps relax competition in the product market, okay? Suppose that, that that's the case, uh, then how about incentives to come up with a new product uh, in the first place? So how about incentives for product innovation, okay? Understanding that, okay, there can be a competition softening effect of overlapping ownership, then what does this do uh, to the ex-ante investments to to try to bring a new product to the market in the first place. The model that we have consists of two stages. Okay, in the first stage, uh, firms invest in R&D. This is the innovation stage. Okay, and crucially, here we have the feature that investing a higher amount in R&D raises the chance of success, raises the chance of being able to bring a new product to the market. Okay, so the first stage is the R&D stage, the second stage um, um, is the product market. And here we have different scenarios. It is possible that both innovations succeed. Okay, we are looking at a duopoly. So if, if both innovations succeed, then firms are going to interact with each other in a duopoly market. 
Okay? That's one scenario which can unfold. It's also possible that just one of the firms succeeds and the other one fails. Okay? One firm's innovation is successful, but the other firm's innovation is not successful. In that case, the successful firm is a monopolist in the product market. Okay. And then the other scenario, which is important, is the scenario without entry, when both innovations fail, and there is no product in our model, and so no product market. Okay. So this is the setup that we have. And our, the main question we are interested in is, how does overlapping ownership in this model um, affect the incentives to innovate um, in the first stage? Okay. What we find is that there are two opposing effects. Okay. On the one hand, we have a familiar business eroding effect. Here, the idea is that firms, if they succeed, then they might, uh, then they become an extra competitor, and, and this uh, this effect hurts the rival firm. For example, if the rival is successful and I succeed as well, then I'm creating competition for my rival. I'm 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 harming the rival's profit. Through overlapping ownership, firms take this business eroding effect into account, okay? And, and they partially internalize that, okay, my own success uh, hurts the rival's profit and I care about this effect through overlapping ownership, okay? So overlapping ownership by, by increasing the degree to which firms internalize the business eroding effect leads to a reduction in investments in R&D, okay? This is the familiar business eroding effect. We also identify an opposite effect, what we can call the competition softening effect. And here the idea is that overlapping ownership by softening competition with duopoly tends to raise the duopoly profits when both innovations succeed, okay? For example, by relaxing price competition, uh, the scenario where both innovations are successful and, and firms compete in a duopoly is more profitable for the firms. Okay? Now, what does this do to the investment incentives? Firms understand now that even if both of them succeed, even if both innovations succeed and the market becomes a duopoly, that's relatively attractive because duopoly profits are high due to soft competition. Okay. So what we show is that overlapping ownership by improving the prospects of duopoly competition can actually make, uh, can actually raise the benefit of innovating and so can raise the um, incentives to engage in R&D. Okay. Our main result is that whenever the competition softening effect is sufficiently strong, okay, then overlapping ownership raises investments in product innovation uh, instead of reduces investments in product innovation. Okay? And we also show that an increase in investments in R&D can end up being beneficial for consumers as well. Okay? So there can be a bright side associated with overlapping ownership uh, when it comes to product innovation. Two factors, however, make it more difficult for overlapping ownership to benefit consumers. Okay? Um, even if investments go up in product innovation, it does not necessarily mean that consumers uh, uh, benefit in expected terms. And what we show is that, for example, when the R&D project is straightforward, uh, so has a very high success chance in equilibrium, then even if overlapping ownership raises investments, um, it might not be enough for consumers to actually benefit from overlapping ownership. Okay. And then second, we also look at the presence of an incumbent technology. What happens if firms already have access to an old technology, even if they fail with their new product innovation? Uh, and we show that the presence of an incumbent technology also makes it more difficult for overlapping ownership to benefit consumers. So here we, we actually try to give... Um, some substance. Yes. Is there a question? Marco, so, if you don't mind, you can switch off your mic. Uh, sorry. 
So, so here we try to give some substance. Uh, so in, in, in general, we, we, we show that there is a business eroding effect and a competition softening effect. Uh, and we also try to uh, give concrete insights for competition authorities by showing that, okay, in particular when R&D projects are straightforward as opposed to very complex and also in the presence of, of an incumbent technology, competition authorities should be a little bit more critical. It, it becomes less likely that overlapping ownership benefits consumers uh, under these circumstances. A few words about the related literature. Of course, competition and innovation is a very important topic in the field of industrial organization, but more specifically, uh, also the role of overlapping ownership has been studied in the context of uh, process innovation. And here the paper by Lopez and Vives um, is an important reference. So they focus on incremental innovations, which reduce the marginal cost of the firms. Okay, and what they find, for example, is that if overlapping ownership uh, softens competition, then it causes firms to sell a lower volume in the product market. Okay? They don't compete so fiercely, so they sell less volume. This also means that any effort to reduce the marginal cost of production is going to be less valuable for the firms because the marginal cost reduction is then going to be applied to a smaller volume. So in their model, uh, there is no um, innovation enhancing effect uh, of overlapping ownership in the absence of any spillovers. So they require R&D spillovers in order for overlapping ownership to potentially raise innovation incentives. Recent work by Shelehia and Spiegel looks at a different model where the ownership structure can be asymmetric. And they look at, for example, what happens if one firm raises its financial stake in the other firm and what are the effects, okay, for example, on, on innovation. They focus on pure Bertrand competition. Um, and in their model, they show that, for example, if one firm succeeds in innovation and the other one fails, then partial ownership has the effect of raising profits. Okay, and that's a, a, a potential mechanism whereby innovation incentives can go up. Okay, we don't have such an effect in our model because if only one firm succeeds and the other one fails, um, overlapping ownership in our model has no effect because the innovation is drastic. Okay, the, the successful firm is simply a monopolist in our model. Instead, what we focus on is what happens when both firms succeed in innovation. And we show that overlapping ownership in that case can soften competition when both firms succeed. Here we have general mode of product market competition. And through this channel, uh, innovation incentives uh, can go up. There's also a, a paper by um, Dimitrio Sorpas, who is also here. Um, and his co-author about the dynamics of investment. And in, in their paper, it is shown that even though overlapping ownership can um, delay entry by the follower, uh, it, such an effect actually lengthens the duration of monopoly and so can, can um, make uh, can cause fierce competition between the firms in order to become leader in the first place. Okay, so they focus on dynamic effects. There's a, a lot of attention going to, to nowadays uh, and also in, in the past, uh, but still this debate is ongoing. What are the effects on, of mergers on innovation? Okay. Um, and so, for example, here we have uh, some recent work in this area by, by these co-authors. And then finally, R&D collaboration. Um, the classic literature here has highlighted the importance of spillovers. All right. So this gives a little bit of introduction to the theme. Now let me say a few words about the outline for today's seminar. So first of all, I'm going to walk you through the model. What are the key assumptions of the model? How does the model work? And then we're going to focus on the main question for today. What's the effect of overlapping ownership on investments? Okay, Is it possible for investments to go up and what's the condition? 
Then we're going to zoom in on consumer welfare. It's not necessarily so that any increase in investments necessarily makes uh, consumers better off, and this is something that we need to study. And then finally, we're going to focus on an, an extension of our model, which allows for the presence of an incumbent technology. Okay, and here we're going to show that the presence of an incumbent technology actually uh, restricts the scope for overlapping ownership to, to increase innovation. And then concluding comments. So that's the, the plan uh, for today. Are there any questions at this point or any comments? If, if all is good, then I will start by walking you through the model. Beginning with the objective function. In the presence of overlapping ownership, the objective function of a firm, for example, firm I, consists of two components. Firm I cares about its own profit by I. Okay. Um, and also it can care to at least to some extent about the profit of its rival from J by J, okay? And we have here a parameter mu, which re reflects the degree of internalization. For example, if mu is equal to zero, then you can see that we are back in the baseline in the most standard model where firm I just cares about its own profit. But as mu goes up, okay, the firm internalizes to a higher extent also the profit of the rival firm J. Okay. And for example, if mu goes all the way up to 0.5, okay, then the firm places equal weight on its own profits versus the profit of its rival. Okay. This is a reduced form representation of overlapping ownership. What's crucial here is that, so for example, it can capture common ownership, but also cross ownership. What's crucial here is that a higher amount of cross ownership in the industry expands uh, the degree of internalization, the extent to which firms internalize their rivals' profits. That's crucial. And so from a mathematical point of view, we are interested in the effects of mu, an increase in internalization. Okay. Same goes for cross-ownership. If there is more cross-ownership in the industry, if these financial stakes go up, then we expect firms to internalize each, other, each other's profits to a higher extent. And in our model, this means that mu goes up. Okay. And so we're going to be looking at the effects of mu in our model on investments. That's how we approach it. A few words about the success probability function in our model. In the first stage, firms make a decision about how much to invest, and we're going to call that investment XI. Okay. If the firm invests more, it has a higher chance of success. Okay. So the success probability here is denoted by F of XI, and F is a, is a probability. A higher investment raises the success probability at a decreasing rate. So whereas the first derivative is positive, the second derivative is negative. There are diminishing returns to R&D in the sense that you, know, you can see that the function is is concave, okay? and this is what we need also to, to make the problem well behaved. A positive investment volume is necessary for success, and the success probability never reaches one. And we're also going to look at a situation where the hazard rate is either constant or decreasing. Okay, here we have the expression for the hazard rate. To what a, so an, an extra investment raises the to what extent does an extra investment raise the success probability, taking into account that uh, um, we are not yet successful at this point? Okay, and so the hazard rate in our model is going to be weakly decreasing. All of these assumptions guarantee that the success probability function is sufficiently concave. And this will then allow us to focus on a symmetric equilibrium. In the product market, there are several scenarios, okay? And you can see here three columns, okay? On the one hand, how many firms succeed in innovation? None of the firms succeed, one or two. What are the associated probabilities? And what are the profits in the product market in each of these cases? Okay, so let's begin 
uh, with the scenario where none of the firms succeed. This happens with probability one minus f of f of x a, so the chance that uh, a fails, multiplied by one minus f of x b, the chance that b also fails. And in that case, there is no product, so profits are zero. It's also possible that exactly one firm succeeds in innovation. There are two ways in which this can happen. Either firm A succeeds and firm B fails, or firm B succeeds and firm A fails. Okay. And in, in that case, the successful firm is a monopolist in the product market. And we will say that the profit in the product market of the monopolist is equal to pi M, okay, where M stands for monopoly. And then finally, it's also possible that both firms succeed in innovation with probability f of xa, xa multiplied by f of xb. And in that case, firms earn duopoly profits in the product market. Okay, and we will say that the duopoly profit per firm is, is a fraction of the monopoly profit. And that fraction we are going to define as delta, which is potentially a function of mu. Okay. So here, for example, if delta is very low, then this means that firms compete very, very fiercely. Duopoly profits are very low. Uh, but whereas if delta is very high, uh, for example, um, in between 0.5 and 1, then this means that a duopoly profit per firm is, is fairly high uh, relative to the monopoly profit. Okay. We're going to allow the duopoly profit to depend on mu. This is crucial. Overlapping ownership can soften competition in the product market and so can raise the, the, the profit per firm under duopoly. Mathematically, this means that this first derivative, delta prime as a function of mu, is positive, okay? weakly positive. Okay? We're also going to assume that duopoly competition is not too intense in the sense that this fraction delta exceeds mu. There are many modes of competition that satisfy this property. For example, no competition. This is something we show in the paper. And also hoteling competition whenever the transportation cost parameter is not too low. Okay. Um, and this is something that we need uh, in, or, in order to guarantee a stable symmetric equilibrium. Okay. I will, I will come back to this uh, question later on as well. Okay. A third assumption that we operate with is the fact that R&D investments need to be attractive for the firms. So if, if the rival, for example, doesn't invest anything, it, then it makes sense for me to invest something okay? so that investments are, are positive in equilibrium. All right. We have now described the model. Okay, remember two stages, innovation stage, then product market. Now in this model, we can think about the, what's now the effect of overlapping ownership on equilibrium investments. Okay, And to analyze this question, we operate in several steps. First, we look at the objective function of the firms in more detail in order to find out what, the, what do the equilibrium investments look like. Okay. And then once we have obtained those equilibrium investments, then we can look at the role of mu, the role of overlapping ownership. Okay, what happens if there is an increase in mu? Do investments go up or down? Okay, so let's begin with the objective function and then we think about optimal investments. So the objective function, remember that it consists of two parts, right? The profit firm I cares about its own profit and then also partially cares about the profit of the rival. Okay, what is the profit of firm I? Okay, several states of nature, uh, several so several scenarios in the product market need, need to be taken into account. Firstly, there's the scenario where I firm I succeeds and firm J does not succeed with innovation. In that case, firm I obtains a monopoly profit. It's also possible that both firms succeed. In that case, firm I obtains a duopoly profit, which is a fraction delta of the monopoly profit. And certainly firm I incurs the investment cost. Same procedure for firm, J, uh, for firm J's profit. It's possible that firm J is a monopolist in the product market. It's also possible that firm J um, 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 
earns duopoly profits, and certainly uh, firm J uh, incurs an investment cost, XJ. So here's the, the full objective function of firm I. Using the objective function, we can think about optimal investments. And to do that, we look at the first order condition, which, uh, which needs to be satisfied in order for the investment of firm I to be optimal. Okay, so we look at the derivative. And here, what you can see is that three terms are important. On the one hand, um, when firm I decides about potentially in increasing its investment, it's going to think about, okay, maybe my rival is unsuccessful with probability one minus F of X chain. In that case, if I manage to become successful, I become a monopolist, okay? So there's a marginal return associated with the scenario where the rival is unsuccessful. But it's also possible that my rival uh, would have been successful in any case. Okay, and in that case, if I become successful too, then uh, several things happen. On the one hand, by becoming successful as well, uh, I am destroying the monopoly position of the rival. And I care about that through my overlapping ownership stake mu. So I, I, I internalize that, okay, by becoming successful too, I'm not able, so I'm destroying the monopoly position of the rival and this is bad for me uh, because I internalize this effect. On the other hand, those monopoly profits of the rival are being replaced uh, by duopoly profits uh, for both of us. Okay, and if, if these duopoly profits are high, then that's a good thing. And it, then it's going to encourage me to invest. Okay. And then the third term reflects the investment cost. So, Richard, can I ask something about this uh, this this slide? Yes. yes. Uh, if I remember correctly, you said that um, there is an existent technology already. So they, these guys uh, make money before they invest in uh, in the new tech. <laughs> So, so far in the model, we, so in our baseline model, we do not have the ah, okay, okay. Fine, okay. technology and you cannot, so for example, if there would be an incumbent technology, then for example, even if both firms fail in their innovation, then they would still be able to earn some profit. Mm -hmm. uh, so far, we do not yet look at okay, okay. such an effect. And then later in the seminar, um, I, I will explain what happens uh, in the presence of an incumbent technology. Perfect, thanks. All right. Some uh, um, comments about the symmetric equilibrium. So what we show is in the paper is that under our assumptions, there exists a unique symmetric investment equilibrium, and it also satisfies stability. Okay. This is worth mentioning because in, you know, investments are strategic substitutes. If my rival invests a high amount, then um, it's going to become less attractive for me to invest a high amount as well. Okay? Investments are strategic substitutes. And so we do need to check that reaction functions are not too steep. And there are two model ingredients that, that serve uh, for us to prove stability. Firstly, the fact that the hazard rate is weakly decreasing, okay, there are diminishing returns to R&D. And so you can imagine that when there are diminishing returns to R&D, it makes sense for both firms to invest a um, positive amount, to invest a symmetric amount. And then also the fact that duopoly competition is not very intense is helpful in our, in our proof. And here we can think about the left-hand side and the right-hand side. So let's begin with the delta, for example. If duopoly profits are very high, then it's kind of natural that uh, the symmetric investment equilibrium, which possibly leads to a duopoly in the product market, that that one is stable. Okay? But also the, the, the degree of internalization, so the, the degree of overlapping ownership shouldn't be too high. For example, if, if my rival invests a high amount, okay, and the degree of overlapping ownership is very substantial, then I take into account that my own investment is going to harm the rival okay, if I become successful too. And I take into this effect into account through the overlapping ownership stake mu. Okay? And so you can clearly see that my investment is then going to be very responsive to the investment of the rival. Okay? 
So what we find is that delta being larger than mu uh, uh, is enough for us to, to guarantee stability of the symmetric equilibrium. All right. Our main result is about the effect of overlapping ownership on investments. And what we, what we show is that there's a crucial condition. Here's the condition, um, uh, which, which leads to a result whereby overlapping ownership increases investments in product innovation. The term here on the left-hand side, delta is prime as a function of mu, this one is crucial, okay? When, when overlapping ownership substantially softens competition uh, or not, this, this is what's important. For example, if the effect is very small, if overlapping ownership does not really change very much the duopoly profit, then our business eroding effect is going to dominate. Okay? Then overlapping ownership simply induces firms to internalize that their own success might hurt the rival. And so a higher degree of overlapping ownership is then going to reduce investments. There's no Schumpeterian trade-off in this case because overlapping ownership, not only does it soften competition in the, in the, in the product market, it also seems then to decrease investments in innovation. However, when the effect of overlapping ownership on duopoly profits is, is large. Okay, when, duopoly, when overlapping ownership substantially softens competition so that duopoly profits go up by a lot, then the competition softening effect is going to, to dominate. Firms then understand that if they succeed in innovation and they end up in duopoly, those profits are going to be very attractive. Okay? And so this effect is going to stimulate investments up front. Okay. One thing which is worth pointing out is that the success probability in equilibrium does not play a role in the condition, which is kind of interesting. So one way to think about this is that the business eroding effect, this happens when the rival is successful. In that case, my own success hurts the rival. Okay. And also the competition softening effect also happens in the in case where the rival is successful, in that case, uh, my own success um, you know, leads to a duopoly and potentially soft, softer competition due to overlapping ownership. So when we compare the business eroding effect and the competition softening effect, the probability of success of the rival firm seems to cancel out in the comparison. Okay. And this is insightful because it means that, you know, if, we're looking at stochastic innovation, right? So, and it doesn't matter if the success, if the project is very complex and the success probability is very low, or if the project is very straightforward and the success probability is very high. Okay, the condition for overlapping ownership to increase investments is going to be the same. All right. A few words about consumer welfare. Okay. Uh, may I ask you something? I think it would be nice to tell us uh, what happens in the classical model. Let's say linear could not uh, differentiate uh, with homogeneous goods, linear, uh, let's say Bertrand with uh, uh, differentiated goods, just to have an idea of what happens in this classical standard model and uh, uh, under what conditions um, we get uh, uh, the result. Um, I can see that uh, this is not this is not possible in the case of uh, homogeneous Bertrand. No? That never happens there, but it happens uh, under Cournot. So mm -hmm. some discussion of this type will help the yeah. help us to understand what's going on. Yeah, very good, very good. Um, I I will also come back to a, a few modes of competition that that we have analyzed. In particular, uh, we have some work about Cournot competition and also hoteling competition. And then to see, you know, what does the, what does the analysis predict for those uh, modes of competition? Very good. Let's proceed with thinking about consumer welfare. Okay, and here um, it's important to point out that even if overlapping ownership stimulates investments, uh, it does not necessarily mean that consumers are better off um, 
because consumers can also be harmed by, by the fact that there's softer competition with duopoly. And so we, we need to trade off these two effects. And that's essentially what we will do in our formal analysis. Okay. It's useful to introduce some extra concepts. Firstly, equilibrium investment per firm is going to be denoted by X um, and then this um, star. Consumer surplus with duopoly, CSD, okay, which can be a function of the degree of overlapping ownership. So we are allowing uh, the degree of overlapping ownership to affect consumer surplus with duopoly. This is very natural because a higher degree of overlapping ownership probably softens competition with duopoly and so makes consumers worse off under duopoly. This is a very important effect in our analysis. And then third, we need to think about also consumer surplus with monopoly, which we, we are going to denote uh, as follows, CS, consumer surplus under monopoly. And with these extra uh, uh, ingredients, we can now construct our expected consumer surplus. What's the expected consumer surplus? Here we need to think about the different scenarios in the product market. Perhaps if both firms succeed in innovation, the market is a duopoly okay, and consumers um, earn the associated surplus. It's also possible that exactly one of the firms succeeds in innovation, but the other one doesn't. In that case, the market is a monopoly. Okay, and it's also possible that no product, um, no, no innovation succeeds so that there is no product in the market whatsoever. And in that case, consumer surplus is equal to zero. Kurt, can I ask something about CSM, please? Yes. So CSM is not a function of, a, of new, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And But uh, if I invest, I account for your potential investment, you might fail and I will be a monopolist, but this doesn't mean that I didn't account for you, correct? Does this make sense? Um, so, so, um, I think that your comment um, relates to the objective function of the firms where, okay, firms, when they decide about investments, they take into account the monopoly position of the rival. That's very correct. Okay. Here we are constructing the, consume, the expected consumer surplus function, okay? And the question is, under monopoly, if one firm succeeds and the other one fails, how high is the consumer surplus? Okay, but... Um... And, and, let's and, say that, yeah, and, but let's and, say that the consumer surplus depends on how much one of the guys invests, and that thing depends on new. So CSM shouldn't depend on new through the choice of the leader. So we're going to look at how overlapping ownership affects the consumer welfare. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Um, but, but, but it, yeah. So. So, but, but from the perspective of consumers, there are, you know, there are these, these various market structures that can unfold. Either there's a duopoly and then there's surpluses going to depend on how soft is the competition between competitors. But if just one of them, of the firms succeeds, then the, the price that will be charged by the monopolist or the quantity that will be sold is not going to depend on the degree of overlapping ownership because only the successful firm has a product. There's no competitive interaction in that case. Mm -hmm. I get uh, it. Thanks. Yeah, maybe I, I may also make a comment on, on Dimitrios question. Um, I think his question would, would be, uh, or he, the point he makes would, would be completely appropriate if, if the nature of the, in, of the successful project would, would depend on investments. Here we have specified a given uh, known ex ante uh, character of the of the pro of the successful innovation. I see. I see. Okay. Thanks. All right. Thanks. With, with this 
consumer surplus function, we can now investigate what's the role of overlapping ownership. How does overlapping ownership affect consumer surplus? Okay. And we, we can do this mathematically by taking the derivative. Okay. And what we can distinguish is a direct effect and an indirect effect. The direct effect says what happens for fixed investment levels. Okay. What's the effect of overlapping ownership on consumer surplus? And here, the effect is clearly negative. Overlapping ownership softens competition with duopoly and so is going to lead to lower consumer surplus uh, when the market, market ends up being a duopoly. Okay? So th there's a direct harm of overlapping ownership. However, we also need to think about how overlapping ownership potentially changes the investment levels. Okay? And so the probabilities that we end up in each of these scenarios also changes as a result. Okay, for example, if investments expand due to overlapping ownership, then uh, overlapping ownership in this way can sometimes cause a switch between a monopoly market structure and a duopoly market structure. Okay, or for example, if investments expand, it becomes more likely that some firm is going to be successful as opposed to none of the firms. Okay, and so the indirect effect captures, captures this effect. Which, which is channeled through a change in the investment levels. Okay. We would expect that the direct effect and the indirect effect counteract each other. Okay. So the direct effect is weakly negative. Softer competition with duopoly that tends to lead to lower consumer surplus uh, under duopoly. Uh, but it's also possible that um, there's an indirect, so that for example, that any expansion of investments uh, tends to benefit consumers okay, by making duopoly more likely as opposed to monopoly or the absence uh, of a product. Okay? So there seems to be the trade-off between direct effect and indirect effect. And in general, what we can say is that overlapping ownership then tends to benefit consumers if and only if uh, the competition softening effect of overlapping ownership, which can give rise to an expansion of investments, is sufficiently strong relative to the direct effect of overlapping ownership. Okay. It's useful to zoom in a little bit on this condition. Here we have a fairly general condition, right? Um, but it's useful to, to zoom in a little bit and think about two extreme cases. Okay. I'm going to think about one extreme case where the success probabilities are very low, very complex R&D, and the other extreme case where the success probabilities are very high. Okay. If the success probabilities are very low, then it means that the duopoly scenario does not happen um, with a very high chance. Okay. In fact, the chance that, that the market ends up in a duopoly uh, is very low when success probabilities are low. In that case, the direct effect is going to be negligible. Okay, And then the effect of overlapping on ownership on consumers is almost entirely driven by the indirect effect, an expansion of investments by making duopoly more likely okay? um, tends to benefit uh, consumers. That's an interesting extreme case. The opposite extreme case happens when the success chance is very high. Okay. In that case, there is a trade-off between direct effect and indirect effect. Okay. And so this means that then the bar for overlapping ownership to actually benefit consumers in expected terms is relatively high because not only should it increase investments, but it should also increase investments sufficiently so that the indirect effect offsets the direct harm to consumers. Okay. It's possible to um, illustrate these insights making use of a table. So in the first column, we are thinking about a very complex R&D. Okay. We know that the condition for overlapping ownership to raise investments is that it should substantially soften competition. And when, when R&D is very complex, the, the condition coincides uh, for uh, when it comes to the question whether overlapping ownership also benefits consumers, okay? Because the expected direct effect is going to be negligible in this case. 
However, when R&D is more straightforward, uh, then any increase in investment might not be sufficient for consumers to actually benefit. Okay. So this suggests for competition authorities that um, in order for overlapping ownership to not only lead to an increase in investments, but also to benefit consumers, that this is going to be more likely when R&D is very complex as opposed to very straightforward. Now we can think about concrete modes of competition also, uh, as was suggested uh, by Petrakis here uh, in the, um, in the uh, webinar. So let's first think about Cournot competition, and then we think about hoteling competition. Okay. The model of Cournot competition that we look at is a very standard linear demand and linear cost. And we can characterize the delta, remember that delta is the fraction of, is the duopoly profit per firm as a fraction of monopoly profit. Okay, and we can characterize how this delta depends on the degree of overlapping ownership on the horizontal axis. Okay. Two observations. First of all, you can see that delta is relatively high. Okay. It's always higher than mu. Competition is not very intense with Cournot. And second, you can also see that even though overlapping ownership tends to raise duopoly profits a little bit, the effect is not very large. The function is, um, is not very steep. Okay? And this means that in our model, uh, so what we show is that overlapping ownership um, tends to reduce investments in product innovation. The competition softening effect is not sufficiently powerful with no competition. And here, the, the predictions for consumer welfare are unambiguous. Overlapping ownership harms consumer welfare directly when the market is a duopoly, but also indirectly by reducing investments. Uh, sorry, apologies. Uh, the model is homogeneity. Is that correct? The no competition is with homogeneity. Maria, your, your sound is not very good. If you can repeat, uh, please. Apologies, is now better or not? It's yes, I can hear. Uh, you have considered no competition with, with homogeneous goods, yes? Yes. Okay, okay, thank you. Very good. So, yes, we're looking here at no competition with homogeneous goods. And later on uh, in the next slide, I will also say a few words about hotel in competition with differentiated products. Okay, here we are. Also, once again, looking at a standard model where transportation costs are linear, consumers are uniformly distributed on a unit interval between zero and one, and firms are located at the extremes. Okay, one firm is located at zero and the other one at one. Okay, so the textbook hoteling model, but we, of course, look at the effects of overlapping ownership also in this model. Whenever the transportation cost parameter tau is not too low, for example, 0.3, uh, we can see that delta, duop so which captures the duopoly profit per firm relative to the monopoly profit, is sufficiently high uh, in comparison with the degree of overlapping ownership. So the, our assumption is satisfied. Okay? Duopoly profits are sufficient so that the symmetric investment equilibrium is stable. And here with hoteling, we identify three intervals for mu. First of all, in the first interval, so whenever mu is smaller than uh, this term mu tilde, an increase in overlapping ownership is not going to substantially soften competition. The function is relatively flat. And so it, investments are going to decline in this region. The intermediate interval for mu is characterized by the feature that this delta function is very steep. So any increase in mu, the degree of overlapping ownership, is going to substantially soften competition and substantially raise duopoly profits. Okay, here the competition softening effect dominates. Okay, and investments go up as a function of overlapping ownership. In the third region, we once again see that the curve is flat. Okay, this is because the market coverage constraint starts to bind. And 
we again have a region where an, an, an increase in overlapping ownership leads to reduction of investments. Okay. So our model of hoteling shows that there is this intermediate interval for overlapping ownership, whereby a higher degree of overlapping ownership stimulates investments in product innovation. Any increase in investments is not necessarily enough for consumers to, to end up benefiting from overlapping ownership, right? Remember that we have talked about the role of complex R&D or straightforward R&D. We can, we can try to illustrate um, how these effects play out in the, in the hoteling model. And so first I'm going to show you a figure uh, when R&D is very complex. What's now the effect of overlapping ownership on consumer welfare when R&D is complex? And here we see that in this intermediate interval um, where, where overlapping ownership substantially softens competition, uh, that um, if this effect is, is sufficiently large, so starting ab about here, then overlapping ownership also benefits consumers. And actually consumer welfare reaches a maximum in this model when, when the degree of, when, when the value from you is, uh, almost 0.4. Okay. This can happen when R&D is very complex. However, when R&D is straightforward, and for example, if we look at a constant hazard rate, uh, which is relatively high, so it's easy to do R&D, success probabilities are high in equilibrium, then even though we have a region where of, of, whereby overlapping ownership increases investment, still consumer welfare keeps declining. This is due to the direct effect of overlapping ownership. Overlapping ownership softens competition with duopoly and so harms consumers in the scenario of duopoly. And this effect is going to dominate. And we don't find any uh, interval here where overlapping ownership ends up uh, benefiting consumers. Okay, so these two figures try to illustrate the role of, uh, of the difficulty of the R&D project. When, when R&D is complex, it's possible for consumer welfare to increase as a result of overlapping ownership. Uh, but um, however, when R&D is more straightforward, uh, we should be more critical. All right. Are there any comments or questions at this point? Uh, sorry, I have a question. Yes, I, I, I'm not used to very much to the notion of the expected consumer surplus. So, so I guess we use the notion of expected profit because we have uncertainty and we want to maximize something. So, so here, why do you use the notion of expected consumer surplus? I mean, if you should, I think you should take all cases, all four cases that you have, all four states of nature, and compare them one by one uh, to your reference case. I mean, I don't see how it makes any sense to compare expected consumer surplus here with uh, what you want to, to compare. So, so this is a, 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 a good observation. So what's the, what's the reason for looking at expected consumer welfare? Um, is that in, in our model, innovation is stochastic. Okay, firms can invest in R&D, um, but still the market, if both firms are successful, market is a duopoly, market might also be a monopoly, or there might be no uh, successful innovation at all. And so from the perspective of consumers, uh, we need to take all of these scenarios into account. Okay, So that's, uh, that's why, why we look at expected consumer surplus. And this is very relevant because if we would just take as given the, the scenario, then you know, any change in investments, um, uh, we would not be able to look at. So we are interested, for example, if overlapping ownership increases investments, then the probability of ending up with duopoly goes up, right? Because firms invest a higher amount and so their success probability is going to be higher. And we want to capture such an effect. No, but, but I'm saying you are interested in the exposed uh, consumer surplus. I mean, it would have made sense if you were saying that we have some kind of uh, state that wants to, uh, in the beginning, Exante wants to support the investment and has to give some money. So it looks at what will happen to expected consumer surplus and decide. 
But since no one is using, uh, no one is maximizing expected consumer surplus, I guess you must be interested in the exposed in every in every four possible cases that you have. But I will I will stop here. Maybe we can discuss this a little bit later. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Very good. Okay. Sorry, may I ask a question also? Yes, please. You know, uh, we must be a bit cautious when we compare consumer surplus between duopoly and monopoly. In your case, when um, uh, in both of these states of the world, firms produce the same homogeneous good, then comparing consumer surplus is it's okay. But um, in my humble opinion, when we've got differentiated products or uh, in a possible extension when uh, firms have an uh, ex ante basic technology, let's say. Uh, so the new technology produces a new kind of product, then it might not be um, uh, straightforward to compare consumer surplus between these two states of the world because it's like comparing uh, apples and oranges, you know, because the monopolist uh, might produce a, a different kind of good compared to the duopoly in terms of uh, product differentiation or technology. So the comparison might not be straightforward in some cases. In your case, uh, the, the ones you already sold us, uh, it's okay because the good is homogenous. You know what I'm yeah. trying to yeah, say. Yeah, I, I, I can say maybe a, a few words. I think this is a very good comment. So. In, in this respect, our formulation here, let me, let me try to retrieve it. So this is completely general, the effect of you know, overlapping ownership or consumer surplus. Now, we can, we can think that consumers would benefit from a shift from monopoly to duopoly, that consumer surplus is higher in the duopoly than in the monopoly. Okay. But this is not a completely general feature either. It is possible to construct counterexamples of that. Okay. What we show, and, and we can actually look at this issue also with our concrete modes of competition. So for no competition with homogeneous products, like you suggest, um, everything behaves as expected. But with wholetailing competition, in particular, when, when the degree of overlapping ownership is very, very high, and then there are um, special circumstances where consumers might actually prefer monopoly over duopoly. Okay? So, and then we need to be a little bit cautious uh, with the conclusions. Okay, so this is very, very true. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think, I mean, that here we have entry in a non-existing market, right? So <clears throat> this does not create any problems of the kind, I think, Panayotis mentioned, but if there is an incumbent technology, if there are some products already in the market, then the monopolist can decide to uh, withdraw one product and uh, use the new one and other issues that could be of interest. So let, let us see what happens under the presence of an incumbent technology. How do you model that? Yeah, very good. Um, you, you, you would... You help me very much by making the bridge uh, towards the next uh, the, the next topic. So let's now think about the presence of an incumbent technology. For example, uh, if we think about pharmaceutical companies that try to innovate, they make a new uh, pharmaceutical tre treatment, but there already exists an old treatment uh, which is inferior, uh, but still um, firms can already operate with some kind of old technology. Uh, even if uh, both of them uh, would fail in their innovation, then they would still have access to some positive pro profits. Okay. So how do we model this? We're going to suppose that without any success, so suppose that each firm fails in its innovation, then there are profits uh, per firm equal to pi i, where i reflects the incumbent technology. Okay, so even if both firms fail in their innovation, they still earn a positive profit per firm equal to pi i, and the degree of overlapping ownership can also affect these profits. Okay, so for example, when the degree of overlapping ownership uh, goes up, we would expect softer competition under the old technology, okay, and so profits per firm are then going to be higher. The first derivative is positive. 
That's how we how we think about the presence of an incumbent technology. We're going to make one. Uh, we're going to add one extra ingredient to the model, uh, which is. It's, so it's not an extra ingredient, but we are maintaining the ingredient of the model uh, of a drastic innovation. Here, the idea is that the incumbent technology becomes irrelevant when at least one of the firms succeeds. Yeah. Okay. Which simplifies a little bit the discussion. If you would think of more non-drastic types of innovations, then we need to think about, okay, how does the old technology compete with the new technology, for example? Uh, horizontal, vertical differentiation, those kinds of questions. Uh, but by focusing on drastic innovation, um, we can say that whenever one firm succeeds, you know, then the old technology is completely wiped out. This is a very natural extension of, of, of our model in this way. Let's look at the profit function of firm I. We know that if one of them succeeds and the other one fails, um, the firm the successful firm earns a monopoly profit. Okay. We, we actually maintain uh, this term because, because also making use of the assumption of drastic innovation. Okay. The, the other technology, the old technology doesn't play a role because firm I here is successful. When both firms succeed, again, we have the familiar expression, duopoly profits per firm are equal to delta uh, times uh, the monopoly profit. And now we are adding one extra scenario. If both firms fail, okay, with, which happens with probability one minus f of xi multiplied by one minus f of xj, then firms can still earn a prof positive profit with the incumbent technology. Then both firms operate in the old technology and profits are positive in this case. Okay. So here is the term that we are actually adding uh, to the analysis. Okay. Firms also incur an investment cost. Okay. How, do we, how do we go about and solve this model? We introduce two concepts. Um, firstly, what's the expected benefit of innovation? Okay, and then also what's the expected impact of inno innovation on the rival's profit? So let's first think about the expected benefit of innovation. Okay. I know that if the rival uh, succeeds, with, which happens with probability f of xj, then uh, my innovation is going to give me a duopoly profit. Okay. This term is um, identical in comparison with the baseline model. When the rival does not succeed, then um, my successful innovation is going to replace profits under the incumbent technology with the, with the new profits uh, from my successful innovation. Okay. And here we can see that the incumbent technology actually creates some kind of replacement effect. So I was already earning a positive profit in this scenario, even if I didn't succeed in innovation. And this effect is going to erode for me the marginal benefit of innovating. Second concept looks at the expected impact of innovation on the rival's profit. Okay. I know that if the rival is successful, then my own innovation is going to uh, erode the business of the rival. So I'm destroying the mon monopoly position of the rival and instead um, the rival will earn a duopoly profit. Okay. However, also if the rival fails, which happens with probability one minus f of xj, my own success is going to hurt the rival's profit because now I'm destroying the uh, possibility for the rival to profit under the incumbent technology. Okay. So you can see that there's, there's an extra business eroding, a business stealing effect now. Okay. I'm not just hurting my rival if the rival ends up being successful, but I'm also hurting the rival if the rival uh, was not successful, because then my own innovation uh, wipes out the incumbent technology. Okay. Equilibrium investments are characterized by the first order condition. And here firms um, essentially look at the marginal benefit of innovate, innovation uh, 
considering their own profit, and then they also internalize partially, um, and making use of this parameter mu, the effect of innovating on the arrival's profit. Okay, this is a negative effect, right? Uh, so you could think of the the label E, the, the letter E also has an externality, for example, uh, which is negative. Okay, and then firms also take into account the investment cost. So here we have the first order condition for um, uh, which determines the, the equilibrium investments, where, whereby the benefit of innovation uh, looks like this and the impact of innovation on the rival's profit looks like this. We can see that the presence of an incumbent technology reduces innovation incentives in two ways. On the one hand, it creates some kind of replacement effect. Since I already have access to an incumbent technology, then the marginal benefit of innovation goes down. Okay. There's a replacement effect. And then also the business stealing effect um, is amplified because now I'm not just hurting the rival when the rival is successful, but also when the rival is unsuccessful. Okay, So we can see that incumbent technology reduces incentives to innovate. This is not our main question. However, we are interested in the role of overlapping ownership. Okay, so how does overlapping ownership now impact investments in the presence of an incumbent technology? And here you can see some kind of um, perhaps intimidating condition, but it's very intuitive uh, once you look into it. Okay, so let me take it step by step. And um, I can first introduce the effects that we already know from the baseline model, and then I can explain and show you what, what is being added as a result of uh, the incumbent technology. So first of all, the familiar effects. Okay, we know that overlapping ownership induces firms to internalize that their own success um, hurts the rival when the rival succeeds. And this effect is negative. Okay? This is our familiar business eroding effect. And we also have our familiar competition softening effect. Okay? Overlapping ownership raises duopoly profits when both of us succeed. And so it's going to make innovation more attractive. Now, two things are being added to the model. Okay. First of all, there is a business eroding effect also when the rival is unsuccessful. The rival is unsuccessful with probability one minus f of x. Okay. And in that case, um, my own success hurts the rival's profit because I'm taking away the uh, profit from operating with the incumbent technology. Overlapping ownership induces me to take this extra effect into account. Okay? And so innovation incentives are going to go down as a result. Okay? So we have an added negative effect on innovation. Furthermore, there is also a new competition softening effect. Overlapping ownership also softens competition when both of us operate under the old technology, the incumbent technology. Okay. The intuition is um, very similar. So under the incumbent technology, overlapping ownership leads firms to internalize each, other, each other's profit when they decide about prices, for example. And it's going to soften price competition, for instance, and lead to higher profits. Okay. What this means is that the status quo is more attractive for firms. Okay. Because they, due to overlapping ownership, they now earn higher profits. Uh, in the scenario where none of them succeeds in innovation. So the status quo is more attractive. And why then? Uh, so this then diminishes the incentive to, to, inno to try to innovate and make a new product. Okay. So we see that the presence of an incumbent technology actually adds two new effects to the model. Okay? And both of, the, both of them reinforce each other. They're both negative. Okay, which means that they make it less likely for overlapping ownership to stimulate investments. Okay, so we have the following result. An incumbent technology restricts the scope for overlapping ownership to stimulate drastic innovation. Okay. Once again, we can look at complex versus straightforward R&D. Uh, so, and so first of all, I'm going to look at what happens when the success probability is very low, reflecting complex R&D. And then secondly, I'm going to look at straightforward R&D. Okay. When R&D is very complex, you can see that the familiar effects from our baseline model 
um, uh, become very small. Okay? We are multiplying by a very small number uh, here and also here. Okay, so that this means that the, the new effects are going to dominate. Okay, in that case, the prediction is unambiguous. For very complex R&D, uh, it's clear that overlapping ownership always reduces innovation. Okay. Alternatively, we can also look at very straightforward R&D. Suppose that the success probability is very high. Okay, and in that case, um, the added effects are going to be of very little importance, okay, and only the familiar effects are going to be relevant. Okay, so intuitively, if the R and D project is very straightforward, then the chance of uh, the chance of us uh, co um, continuing to operate with the incumbent technology is, is so small that we don't need to think much about it. Okay, and then we are back in the baseline model. Okay. So it's possible um, to kind of consolidate these observations, making use of a table. Um, we, we have thought about our baseline model, which uh, focuses on the absence of an incumbent technology. Okay, and then we have extended the model to think about the presence of an incumbent technology. And also we have distinguished very complex R&D uh, from very straightforward R&D. Okay. Um, in the first cell here, which is um, to the left, and also the, um, uh, the situation of complex R&D. So here we have our baseline results. Overlapping ownership raises investments whenever it substantially softens competition, okay, and it reduces investments otherwise. And since R&D is very complex, the direct harm of consumers is very limited. And so this means that any expansion of investments uh, would benefit consumers as well. Okay. The picture um, is a little bit more negative when R&D is very straightforward. Here, the condition for overlapping ownership to raise investment stays the same, but the bar for consumers to actually benefit um, is more demanding. Okay. Then we have added the presence of an incumbent technology to the model. And here, if you combine the incumbent technology together, together with very complex R&D, uh, then uh, we have an unambiguous prediction where overlapping ownership always reduces investments. Okay. When R&D is straightforward, here we have uh, once again a trade-off between the direct effect on consumers and the indirect effect. So taking together, our paper shows that it is, you know, shows a channel whereby overlapping ownership raises product innovation. It is possible for consumers to benefit, in particular when R&D is very com complex, uh, but consumers are less likely to benefit, for example, when R&D is more straightforward and also uh, in the presence of an incumbent technology. And so these are two factors that competition authorities can then look at uh, to, to evaluate any any overlapping ownership arrangement. All right, so this is these are the most important um, uh, things that I wanted to, to say to you. So what we have done is to characterize the effect of overlapping ownership on investments in product innovation as opposed to process innovation. There's a competition softening effect through which overlapping ownership can raise investments. And we have also identified two factors that seem to restrict the scope for overlapping ownership to benefit consumers. One is the difficulty of the um, R&D uh, project. If the innovation is very straightforward, uh, we should be a little bit more critical and also the presence of an incumbent technology. Thank you so much for the inputs and I look forward to any further discussion. Hey, thank you, Geert. So we have any questions? Yes, Valanta. Ah, sorry, yes. Yeah, 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 go ahead, Valanta, go ahead. Uh, hello, so, I mean, obviously the, let me start the camera as well. 
Okay, uh, obviously this is a quite clean model. It's a nice thing about it. I mean, the comparisons and... Uh, um, but I was wondering if uh, if you could also extend it in another direction, which is the following, which would complicate, of course, things whenever we had extensions, I understand that things get more messy, which is that uh, you there's another firm that potentially also invests you know, in product introduction. This firm, is not involved in overlapping ownership. It's a, let's call it an independent firm. Okay. So that, I mean, what one could gain, let's say, from this extension, besides complicating, complicating the model, which is not a nice thing, is that, of course, the intensity effects, I mean, the intensity of competition effects will be different. You know, the thresholds, I guess, that you identified, but that's not a real gain. I think the gain would be that it could give you an additional uh, kind of comparisons that you could make, the comparisons of investments of firms involved in over, overlapping ownership versus firms who are not in overlapping ownership, which is a realistic scenario, let's say, that not all firms in the market are necessarily involved in such ownership uh, agreements or stuff like that. So I think that might be... Um, add some new set of results so okay while complicating a bit the analysis of course yeah yeah very interesting if if i may just very briefly respond is that one feature we show is the feature of strategic substitutes so my initial reaction would be that if suppose that the firms inside of the overlapping ownership agreement end up reducing for example, their investments, then we would expect uh, perhaps the opposite uh, qualitative effect on the rival firms. But I, I mean, I have not uh, thought about this question in any formal way. So very good, um, very good idea. Yeah. All right. Are, do we also have other? Yeah, uh, I wanted to ask again, I mean, uh, you showed what happened in Kurno homogenous, and then you went to um, uh, the hoteling where there is competition in prices and heterogeneous products. What happens uh, in the Kurno case when we have some product differentiation maybe is, uh, is of interest to get an idea of how all these results change if uh, products are differentiated? Because differentiation is going to change various results, no various uh, effects. No? So this could be interesting. And maybe we can look at the classical uh, uh, Bertrand with differentiated goods too, to get an idea of what's going on there. It's important because the general conditions are fine, but uh, for the reader, it's nice to have some examples. And see, in this case, you have this result. In the other case, you have another result. Mm -hmm. so, so that's one thing. Now, of course, uh, you have, uh, yeah, the second thing is you have a very nice paper in economics letters about divesting, no? And uh, the new papers are going to go out after that. I'm working also on that. Uh, what happens with divestment? Uh, um, incentives in the case of uh, of your model stability basically foreigners that would be very interesting also question huh? yeah yeah interesting very good thoughts so yes uh, professor yes uh, may i yes yeah. yes, yes. Uh, Thanks, thanks. Thank you very much for the presentation. I, I, I enjoyed it. I, I just want to uh, follow up on the comment of uh, Valanta. So indeed, if you have a, a, another competitor or two, then you have a situation that I call, I say there are outsiders. So people who are not involved in, let's say, common ownership and people who are not involved in investment, right? So in this case, having in mind the Cournot model, we know that common ownership actually is uh, favoring the outsiders, right? And uh, because they're, they're producing more. So 
So, uh, but on the other side, if both innovations are successful, uh, this would uh, mean that the insiders will have lower costs, for example, and there will be some, some, some trade-off between the two. So this is something, I, I guess it's more complicated as Valanda said, but this is something you, you may consider that I think in all these cases, the results change a lot when you uh, move away from duopoly to, a, to more uh, competition. And uh, so that's one comment. And, and the second one, uh, if I may, is that um, I thought of the following while, while you are presenting, you have only two firms. So uh, we care about the, the profits of the other firm and how they will be harmed uh, if we succeed in our innovation and the other firm does not succeed. But um, uh, what if somehow you augment the model and you say, well, what happens to incentives once I become successful and the other firm is not successful? So maybe I have an incentive to transfer the technology to the other firm and see whether I can profit from it or not. I, I don't know the answer. I mean, there, are, <clears throat> uh, there is a, a work with uh, Petrakis and Skartados on this that says it's always in certain... Uh, cases uh, in certain market structures, it's profitable to share the innovation uh, costlessly, uh, yes, uh, without asking for any money. But um, I don't know what will happen in, in your case. So you could have an, another uh, uh, stage where once uh, uncertainty is revealed about uh, the investments, whether they were successful or not, then you say, okay, now what happens to incentive? Do we have an incentive to, to share the innovation or not? I guess this would be a very, uh, I think it's a nice idea to, to as a follow on your, uh, on what you have already done. Yeah. 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 Very good. It also relates a little bit back to the comment earlier, uh, which was about product differentiation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so, for example, if, if the innovation is homogenous, then, uh, you know, then it would be harder to see any gain from, from trade or gain from exchanging a license. Uh, but if products are more differentiated or if firms are located somewhere else, for instance, then the question that uh, you, you pose uh, becomes very interesting. So that's very good. So one thing I would maybe still also like to um, um, react to um, uh, in response to Pet um, Petraki's comment about the role of uh, product differentiation. So our hoteling model does allow for various um, values for the transportation cost. And so um, one feature that we have found irrespective of the transportation cost is that there is this interval for overlapping ownership where, an ex where a, a higher degree of overlapping ownership stimulates investment. So in that sense, the result is kind of robust um, with respect to the degree of product differentiation, only with one exception that if competition is very, very intense, pure Bertrand, then um, we might end up um, in, a, in an asymmetric equilibrium where one firm invests, uh, but the other one doesn't. Okay, so that has also some, some implications. Yeah, what I mentioned is that you change both uh, uh, product from homogeneity to product differentiation and then the mode of competition. So if you change both, then uh, you might end up with a similar situation or a completely different situation. I mean, you have to change one thing at a time. No? Yeah. yeah. And, and then also what seems to come back is the role of um, endogenizing the degree of overlapping ownership. So, so there, this is a relatively, um, um, there's not very much literature about it. There are a few interesting papers that think about, okay, uh, what, what ownership structure should we now expect to emerge in equilibrium? And this is maybe a growing literature also. And also uh, some of the comments that I heard uh, relate to that question. Uh, Dimitri, did you want to ask something? Oh, everything is pretty clear. Thanks. Oh, okay. So, does anybody else want to ask something? No. Okay. Gil, thank you very much for accepting the invitation. Thank you, everybody, for being here with us today. And uh, I hope to see you next Thanks. week.
Yeah. Absolutely. We keep on the same uh, topic, in fact. So if you liked it today, be prepared. <laughs> yeah. th th thanks, everybody, from my side also. I think it was very nice uh, discussing with you and to hear your thoughts. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you very much for your comments. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.